Susan. So Susan um, is currently a postdoc at the Technische Universität Dresden in Germany. Um, her full title is Dr. Susan Auer, with two N for Susan, uh, don't get that wrong. And the title of the talk is Molecular Response of Clubroot Infected Plants to Endophytic Fungus Acrimonium Alternatum. Thank you very much and please take it away, Susan. Yes, hello everyone. Let's see if that's going to work. So I'm sharing my screen now and I hope you can see it. So how does it look like? Do you see what I see? Which should be a presentation. Yep, that's great. So um, first of all, thanks for giving me the opportunity still, although there there's some filtering, <laughs> which is good to know. So that's pretty democratic. That's really good. Um, um, just a few words about me. So I'm a postdoc, but I'm mainly actually a lecturer right now. So I don't really have so much time for science. I just try to do with my students what I can. And I want to talk to you about today about food uh, and some of the molecular stuff that we found out uh, that the plant actually does in response to the disease when it's also challenged with another uh, fungus, which is Acrimonium alternatum. So the first thing, because out of experience, a lot of people um, do not know so much about club root. I think I have to go a little bit into more depth here. A lot of plant pathologists also don't know the disease probably, so don't feel bad if you haven't heard about it. However, club root disease is distributed right now, actually worldwide. This is pretty scary. When I started with club root disease something like 10 years ago, this was not how the map looked like. It was like one quarter of it or something. So now club root disease is everywhere where brassica plants are grown because uh, club root disease is specific to brassica crops. So you can see you have it here all kind of um, on all continents so far. Um, some truths, some hard facts about club root disease. Um, club root disease is one of the most damaging diseases in crucifer crops worldwide. So all kind of cabbage plants are affected by this disease. Um, oilseed rich, also called canola in Canada, or rapeseed as I refer to it, which is a huge cash crop. Um, broccoli, cauliflower, all kind of cabbage varieties you can think of are affected by this disease. And you can see here um, a few, you can see, I'm not sure if you know my, if you see my pointer, but you see here, so on the left side of these panels, there's always the control plants. So this is a rapeseed. And on the right, you see these uh, specific um, clubbed galls. So um, the thing is with club root that it was described already actually a long time ago in 1878 or something, and we still don't know so much about that disease. And just pulled up some numbers. So I don't know right now what's the situation in Australia, but, or in Canada, and Canada it's pretty dire right now as well. For the European Union, um, I have found that the estimated annual yield loss rate right, is 700 kilo hectares of rate, which amounts up to 630 million euros. And this is just for the year to 2018. So this is a pretty devastating disease also economically. So if you look at rapeseed, it's just one crop where this is affected. So this is really bad. Also it spreads actually tremendously. So in Canada, they, they did some digging deeper into the numbers and they found that um, it started in around 2000. So they had in 2003, they had something like 12 infected fields and now they have over a thousand. And that was only in a couple of years, a little more than a decade. So what's the problem actually with club root? I want you to take away, if you take anything away from the talk, at least three facts about club root. The first thing is that club root um, is caused by a trophic protist that's called Plasmodiophora brassicae. So this is a eukaryotic protist. You can see here on the right, um, a funny little, well, pretty colorful tree. And you see on the top, the rhizaria. So the rhizaria uh, are a group which have um, several groups in them and some of them are um, plant pathogens. 
solidify the mixes. This is the group where Plasmodiophora brassica is in. You might know um, another species here from the Plasmodiophorids, actually, which is uh, Spongospora subterranea, which causes the powdery potato scab. So I have to this really here, address this really. We send papers for review. A lot of times the review is to refer to this as a fungus or something. But if you just look here at the, at the bottom, so the fungi are here. So we have a protease, keratic protist. It's not an oomycete, it's, it's a protist. And it's also not a bacterium, and not a virus. So that needs to be taken into consideration when we talk about that disease. So it's a little specific and proxotic. The second thing I would love to have you know about is that Plasmodiophora has a very complex um, biphasic life cycle. So um, this is, in a way, it's very interesting and it's also, on the other hand, preventing us from combating that disease easily. So what happens is we have the resting spore you can see here on the top. The resting spore that is very durable and can stay infective in soils up to 20 years. This resting spore um, hatches a zoospore, which in fact uh, the, uh, the root hairs of susceptible plants. And then in these root hairs, it propagates into something that's called primary plasmodia. And they at least the second type of zoospore, secondary zoospores, which then infect the cortex of the root. And then we see these symptoms and the root swelling. So here's um, a microscope where you can see in the middle and the top, uh, you see normally the root is, as you know, pretty um, well structured. You have the central cylinder and then you have all the other cells nicely organized around this. And what club root does actually is it disrupts the structure. So because the root cells at some point are filled with these plasmodia, which are the machineries for the resting spores in the end. And they are filled with resting spores, which really disrupts the cells and, and lets them break off. And it also very enlarges the cells tremendously. So this is why we have these, uh, this root swelling. Third thing is, so clubroot is, is soil. So it stays in the soil and it's an obligate biotrope. So that means it actually stays in, when you have a field that has been infected or that has been infested with clubroot, you will have that field being infested for the next uh, couple of years as well. So once you have it, because um, when the plants break down, they release these uh, resting spores, which I just uh, mentioned, they stay infective in the soils. They can uh, just any other brassica crop that's up to come. So um, actually a field that has seen club roots is not suitable for any more brassica cropping. And that's a problem. It's a problem because um, let's just take the crop rapeseed again. Rapeseed is a huge cash crop. Use um, from rapeseed we use for human consumption as an oil, or it's used uh, for machine oil. It has a lot of different uh, applications, and farmers get a lot of money when they crop this. So Canada, for example, as a country, depends a lot on rapeseed production because they export that. It's very important for the economy economy did because they have really big problems with club root. They took a lot of money in hand to, to fund actually some good science projects and a lot of scientists and they do very great research on club root right now. Unfortunately, the, the good funding situation is not the case with a lot of other countries. So in the European Union, for example, each country kind of tries to uh, it themselves and this is not really for the benefit as far as I so what happens to uh, soil that with these? Um, we know that infested soil moves from field to field, mainly with machinery. So a huge tractor, a huge field tractor can have something like 50 to 150 kilograms of soil on it that in worst case bears these resting spores and that just get for two adults. So this disease that respect country borders um, with situation we have now in that farmers are in the tight bounds farmers are in they have to make money and they don't really have the time most of the time to clean their machinery really extensively as it would be necessary in order before they move to the another field so this is how that what helped uh, to other fields 
um, control measures that people have undertaken are they use liming, so they try to raise the pH of the soil um, because we know that with a low pH, clubroot infects much better. Um, fungicides have been tested because fungicides can also get zoos for different modes of effects. Um, sustainable would be to have a wide crop rotation to not have brassica crops for the next consecutive years, but to have a break in between for five years. But um, none of these methods so far is sustainable. So crop rotation is basically, would be one of the best options sometimes, but it's not because the farmers are relying on these cash crops in order to get their, um, well, to get their income. And what we also see is when we use chemical control, a lot of that actually is not in the European Union anymore. But um, the response to chemical control on clubwood fields is very inconsistent. So now an idea is what works for a lot of other diseases to really use integrated pest management practices to have a combination um, of practices in order to control that disease. So this is just um, a little cartoon I drew to show you what kind of IPM tools would be available. And if you look, so that is, it, um, starts with the outer layer where you have a preventive uh, crop protection measure, which would be, which would be crop uh, rotation or using tolerant or resistant cultivars. And then in the middle, we are really at the direct treatment of the crop. So um, resistant cultivars, of course, are an option. However, what we know is that Plasmodiophora develops um, within the field. It has, uh, comes in different pathotypes that have a varying degree of viral lens and aggressiveness, and they have come all of the cultivars so far. So the resistance is broken down by the pathogen because it favors uh, specific, very aggressive pathotypes, and then these resistant cultivars are not an option anymore. So we are, for this talk today, we are here at the biological, uh, the biologicals or the biocontrol agent, uh, which could be used in combination with other strategies in order to combat that disease. This is a little lab peek um, how we work with um, Plasmodiophora brassicae. So as I said before, I have to stress it again, it's a biotroph, so we cannot cultivate it outside of the host. And the full developmental cycle until you have the resting spores um, from the plants takes something like four to 12 weeks, depending on the susceptibility of your plant. So we use Arabidopsis for a lot of our studies because this is, a, well, you know, the genetic resources are there. And when we search for new breeding targets, this is where we start our search. Because as I said before, a lot of stuff is not actually known about club root. So this is, you have to start somewhere. And here you can also, you can manage it a full experiment within six weeks. Um, in brassica, so I use, for example, rapeseed or Chinese cabbage, the whole infection cycle, the whole developmental cycle takes something like eight to 12 weeks before you can harvest and have these gulls to work with. And then we store the gulls in the freezer and um, extract the spores when so the th thing is you cannot work in exanic cultures with clubwood because you always when you do the spore extractions of the resting spores you always have a contamination with plant material that also um, has made um, the sequencing of that protist a little challenging so exanic cultures are not possible so <laughs> all the experiments that can go pretty quickly is not really possible with plasmodiophora so what i that here and that con is um, acrimonium alternate. Acrimonium fungi are pretty simple built fungi. Um, they're very um, one of the most simple structured filamentous anamorphic fungi you will find. And they are pretty ubiquitous. So they um, they you will find them in a lot of different environments. There's known to be marine species of that and a lot of land inhabitant um, species and they can colonize uh, a diverse range of organisms. So there are papers of acrimonium species about entomopathogenic fungi. Um, there's at least one paper from clinical research uh, that reports about an acrimonium species that they found in a patient. Um, then there's a lot of plants colonized with these and also fungi. So they can also hyperparasitize uh, fungi. And I'm pretty sure they can also colonize bacteria. Some of these acrimonium species produce specialized compounds such as acrimines or acrimolectones. 
And the species I worked with so far has not been reported to produce any specific compounds. However, the phylogeny of that species is a little complex, as with a lot of fungal genetics. And I'm using one particular strain that has been shown to have actually a good um, effect against um, some diseases. So the type of fungus I work with has been reported from the 90s from Brazil actually to work as a biocontrol agent against tar spot disease. However, because they don't report strain uh, names or numbers, it's not completely clear if it's the same species the same strain. Uh, we know from some European soils where you can find Acromonium alternatum because it likes to inhabit uh, warm temperate soils, that it has um, some effect against uh, powdery mildew in various um, cultivars. And the specific strain that I use um, has been reported to reduce the feeding of diamond moth larvae in cabbage. And it also increased phytosterol content in these plants. So what I have tested so far with some colleagues is what it does colonize. So it works on rapeseed, it can colonize Chinese cabbage, mice, wheat, tomato. And then as I said before, I use it in Arabidopsis a lot. You can see here, right, um, a picture. this is just a variable in staining of Arabidopsis roots. So you see this very tiny hyphae, which are pretty hard to see sometimes within the tissue. And then you can see here from tomatoes, so this is like a re-isolation experiment um, I did on tomato. You can see why the fungus here is growing out of this. So the type of um, experiments I use, um, are, I use soil cultivation for anything it has to do with um, disease rating of club root, because as I said before, it takes something like four weeks until you can see the symptoms and assess the disease. And then I use in the middle, um, I came up with a hydroponic culture solution. So the thing with club root is it does not, in fact, as I said before, you can do any culture dishes or anything. And actually, the gall um, development is best seen in soil. So in sand, the galls do develop, but not so good. But when I do want to do RNA extractions and I do a lot of transcript studies, um, I have to have a method to have a very easy access to the roots because roots are the main um, tissue that I um, investigate right now. So I came up with this hydroponic culture system. It's a combination of what other people have tried as well. This is also inspired by a paper that um, was growing broccoli in, um, in sand. So these are 10 milliliter pipette tips and they are filled with sand and then water with a nutrient solution. They stand in that and here the harvest, these roots here is super quick and easy. So it's a matter of seconds. And if you just think about how much material you need for a good RNA extraction, not so much anymore maybe, but when I started my research something like 10 years back, you still needed considerable amounts of biomass. And so this is uh, what I use right now for a lot of my RNA extractions. And then to study the, the interaction of the, my fungus, Acrimonial alternate with um, well, all kinds of plants, I use a lot of exciting cultures. So what we study here, mainly, as I said, is the, that pathosystem. What happens when we infect uh, Plasmodiophora with club root is you will get these stunted smaller plants here on the left, which have the, the typical um, club root galls with these symptoms and have um, with microscopy, with microscopy, you can see that there were things spores are forming in there. If you infect um, the same uh, Arabidopsis with Acrimonium alternatum, you don't see any symptoms. That's very typical for a lot of endophytic um, organisms that they don't make any symptoms, no obvious phenotype. However, what I have noticed over the years is, because I've done it a couple of times really, is that um, the reproductive success of a lot of the plants is actually better when they are inoculated with acrimonial alternatum. So these plants will produce more flowers. There's also a small paper that we published um, on that in rapeseed. And when we combine both of these microbes, we will have a plant that does not suffer so much from club root. So they will still get root galls, the club root galls, but stems are longer, reproductive success is better, the biomass is actually larger than in those plants that have been inoculated with club root only. So 
So before I did my research on that, we know already that our common alternatum um, can suppress club root disease. This has been done in the group I work in right now before my times. And this is what we are still seeing consistently pretty much. So you see here on the right, the actual plants. And also it has had been shown on Chinese cabbage that an infection with plasmodiophora uh, and acrimonium alternatum actually decreased the infection rate of plants. So less plants were infected with plasmodiophora and the disease index, which is a measure of the severity of the disease was lowered. And this is something we very pretty much see consistently, which is really nice. So I look just to speed that up. I look at gene recognition in plant cells. So I do a lot of RNA extractions. I do a lot of qPCR before we go to the omics um, studies that we do as well. Here's just a small working model of the early response genes I look at. So you might know that when pathogens invade plants that they are detected by plants due, due to specific receptors. Um, here is just an example of two of these. So flagellin sending FLS2 receptor and then BAC1, which can work together. And they can detect these so-called the microbial associated molecular patterns that pathogens release. So these are conserved structures, which can be um, detected. So flagellin, the flagellin sensing receptor detects flagellin, just as the, the name says. And then downstream of that recognition, we have a, a lot of other genes that are activated uh, over certain plant hormones. Here, for example, we have ethylen. So this recognition can lead to callose deposition and other um, measures that the plant can take in order to defend itself. So callose deposition is used to strengthen the cell wall. Um, then there is compounds produced which have antimicrobial properties and so on and so forth. And we, what we also have simultaneously is um, the PTI response. So the pathogen triggered immunity response that at some point in the cascade can activate uh, working transcription factors, which then can activate PR1, for example, which is the pathogenesis related protein one. I think there's going to be another talk about uh, pathogenesis related proteins. And I'm looking very forward to that. So this is the other response that I look at. And I also look at intermediate and late responses. So again, this is just a very small kind of model. It highlights some of the genes that I used to look at in the last years. So from the side of the salicylic acid, which is one of the major stress hormones um, and the genes that are triggered in that case, and then um, jasminate and ethylene related genes that are triggered. These are the genes that I look at. So this is um, what I mainly do. I look at and a lot of these time points, intermediate and late time points. And in the end, usually there comes the disease rating. Bear in mind, so that there's always these four groups that I look at, and they need a crucial amount of plants. So a lot of these transcript analyses are done on roots, was the major point of study that I had in the last course. And this is destructive, so there's always a lot of plants you have to raise, or you need a lot of hands, which we don't have actually in the lab. And then with brassica, you can do similar things. And this is this rating, as I said before, it takes a little longer until it's fully developed. So now just a few of the, the stuff that we found. We used a microarray a couple of years back to detect early responses in our Rhodopsis roots. And what we found was, first of all, that the numbers of differentially expressed genes in the mixed inoculation of acrimonium and plasmodiophora was actually much higher than, well, not much higher. It was higher than what we found uh, with plants and plant roots that were only inoculated with acrimonium or only with plasmodiophora. So this was an, an early time point that was laying within the time frame when plasmodiophora still gets established in the roots, was in the first um, primary infection stage where it makes these um, these primordia, these um, these structures in the beginning that release the primary zoospores. So it could be that um, the few genes that were triggered here are actually because there was some sort of a lack of um, response in the plants because the infection of plasmodiophora was not established that well. But doesn't explain why we have a lot of genes triggered then when we have these co-inoculating plants, which have here the acrimonium and plasmodiophora at the same time. So the response of plants to both of these microbes at the same time was 
elevated. That's something we see also with a lot of the, the genes we investigated. This is a visualization of the stuff we found here at a very early time point. And you can see a lot of hormones are actually involved here in that stress response. You see cell wall changes, um, you see proteolysis, PR proteins are triggered. And then here we see signaling work transcription factors and others. And secondary metabolites are beginning to be triggered, but if they will actually produce remains to be seen. This is the comparison with both the other groups. You can see here, so this is the plasmodiophora one, where you see not so much is going on. So less genes here are triggered. And also again, here less genes are triggered. And there's not so much overlap between these three groups. So we did a lot of um, PCR also to confirm findings. And what we came up so far is that from the genes I showed you earlier, at least the genes for the receptors that could probably detect plasmodiophora or acrimonium or both, we saw that in this mixed inoculation, um, the fungus led to something like um, an increase in um, FLS2 receptor gene transcripts. So we, we found more of this here in comparison to with plasmodiophora only. So if you look here at the top right and in the middle, you see actually FLS2 was not triggered at all in this early response. Some papers, in some papers, um, it was speculated, or actually, it's it's one of the well, one um, opinion right now is that probably when BAC1 and FLS2 work together, probably they can trigger that they can, of course, make a this pathogen triggered immunity response, and maybe they are also able then to um, help the plant to defend against a uh, club root. Because what we also found um, in later time points is that PL1 was actually triggered, and the level of PL1 in the co inoculated plants with Plasmodiophora and Acrimonium is always higher than it is uh, with Plasmodiophora alone. So obviously, the fungus does something, either it enhances um, recognition or it does something, something else. So you can see here. With acrimonium alone, only FLS2 was not triggered actually. It was downregulated a little bit, and also BAC1 was only slightly upregulated. But yeah, these are just some intermediate results right now. What we find consistently with all studies is always PL1. This is a very consistent response whenever we have um, a co inoculation, we have both microbes in the plant, we always have an elevated amount of PL1 compared to the other two treatment. So the plants have, in theory, probably um, yeah, shown an elevated response that might trans, um, that might um, lead to these decreased symptoms to that suppression that we see in the end. Um, we started to do some omics, some proteomics, so I just going to go through this rather quickly. Um, we now look also at the upper plant parts at the Shoot. So, of course, it's nice to have some transcript data of PCR or microarray. You would do probably direct RNA seq today. Um, with the omics response, however, with proteomics, you can see what actually comes up then in terms of protein turnover. And here we found so in roots that's, that yielded much more proteins, which is not surprising me because you have the rubisco um, and the shoots, which give a super large um, noise, so to say, and it, it covers a a lot of things you probably not attack then in shoots. So in the roots, we found some very interesting candidates. We found um, a lot of proteins like their metabolite. Further look into this um, with functional analysis. And just here are candidates which are interesting in terms of plant defense. So um, in roots, we found an elevated amount of root endochitinase proteins. We found um, some other um, hormone-related um, proteins, which were either more abundant or less abundant than in the other groups. And so far, we found also some very interesting candidates, which we will pursue further. So I'm not going to show that here now because it's still intermediate. But we also, what we do now also, we look at um, the plasmodiophora proteome, actually to see what's going on in here. 
And then a few more words about brassica. So I'm working also with rapeseed. You can see here the symptoms of rapeseed um, weeks after inoculating. And on the right, you see that actually when, if we think about priming, we want to introduce but that one has an elevated um, defensive response when it is challenged um, with um, a pathogen that's not so drastic, and then it gets challenged again with another pathogen that's actually pretty drastic, something like Plasmodiophora. You can sometimes see the elevated, often actually response combat the disease much better. And this is what we tried here in rapeseed. So I first challenged the plants with the fungus, and then I inoculated with Plasmodiophora. And in this small time frame that you have in between both of these treatments, you can already see that the number of uninfected plants here on the right, um, on the top panel on the left, the number of uninfected plants were considerably more than the number of um, uninfected plants that were in the control group with only the Plasmodiophora. So also, this is just a hint I mean, to uh, elaborate on that, but we use the fungus before we actually challenge plants with plasmodiophora, we actually see uh, the plants doing much better and have an, an increase in vitality. They have better reproductive success and they also have larger biomass. So the future paths we are going right now with certain different collaborations. We now luckily also have another postdoc in our lab who's working on club root disease. We have industry partners that uh, we work together with. We are now looking at that interaction from the omics part of you. So we do, we're going to do proteomics, metabolomics, lipidomics, and then look at some hormone related transcripts. We started looking at the cytokinin um, transcripts in the roots and then how that transpires into the proteome. And now we are also right now doing um, more work on acrimonium, so with some collaboration partners. However, if you're willing to collaborate on working on this specific fungus, I would be very happy to chat with you because, as I said, we don't really have so many hands and I'm always eager to look for companions who work on that with us together. So that's it for now. Thank you very much for tuning in. Please stay inside and do your science in a lab where no one, no one else, um, will enter for the next weeks. Um, as I said, if you have some collaboration ideas, I'm very open to that. Um, working with Clubroot can be fun, as you can see here. So we have these different um, phenotypes here. I dubbed them the chicken, the caterpillar, and so you have a great time and you don't feel isolated so much. So thank you very much. Who are you going to do the clapping? <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, very good entertainment with the wine. Um, <laughs> so there are a couple of questions and I'm going to just pick some of those. Um, so the first question which was there was about so you displayed the differential gene expression uh, plus minus the fungus and then plus minus the bacteria, like, sorry, the protist. Um, so like, <laughs> like, what do you think the molecular mechanisms are there? Like, how does the fungus, together with the protist, actually lead to this enhanced PTI components? So yeah, one thing is, as I said, I tried to mention the maybe a better recognition. So when the fungus triggers uh, genes that are used for recognition of pathogens, probably that's working better with acrimonium alternatum, because what we found was, what other people also have found, that you have a suppression in these very early detection um, mechanisms. So we know from plant immunity, if the plant's able to detect um, specifically some sort of pathogen, then it can respond. If it doesn't detect, then it cannot really respond accordingly. And if you disrupt, if you're a pathogen and you disrupt that fine-tuned machinery of recognition and response, then you can be very successful. Plasmodiophora also does a lot of effectors. So you can also, this is something that colleagues of mine are investigating right now. So hasn't been so well investigated yet, but that's the second thing. So I think recognition, that's the thing. Probably acrimonium does um, also compete for resources. So there's something that, you know, just space could be because it colonizes pretty rapidly. So it could make also something like wraps a tight 
hyphal network, and then the fungal, uh, the, the protists cannot um, invade so well anymore. The zoospores of the protists are actually a weak spot of that disease because they are short-lived. And if you, for example, that's what people have tried. If you can have the resting spores hatching and have these um, zoospores in the soil, and then you present it with some crop that can be probably um, infected, but that does not develop the disease, you can get rid of some of these clubroot um, contamination in the soil. So maybe it's, it's a spatial thing, or it's a recognition thing, or it's, yeah, a plant strengthening thing. So yeah. different opportunities. Yeah, so there was another question which was along the protest. So, which I forgot the name already. Um, so the question was, how many factors do they have and how are these effectors delivered? Um, I, I'm not a good person to speak about that. Um, my Canadian colleagues are researching that. So if you're interested in that, search for anything that Canadians are publishing right now. Um, how they are delivered. Um, so what the, what the protist does is it actually injects its cellular content into the plant cells. So it, it works with, there's the German terms for this, I'm sorry, but it's called Stachel and something else. So it actually does inject its cellular content. So this is the mode of infection for that protist of how it does invade plant cells. So the effectors also will have a secretion signal yeah. or the effectors are also going to be delivered just by some sort of secretion, whatever. So if it's inside of the, the cell, um, it, it's anyway, you know, if you release a effector that's not detected by any um, receptor, by any, I don't know, then you're pretty successful. Right. So there's another question just coming in and there were more other questions. So in the disease control perspective, do you think that acrimonium in inoculation would activate plant immunity continuously and would lead to plant energy waste when it's not infected with the plasmo oh, protist. Plasmodiophora. Yeah, people call plasmodium also. It's also fall. <laughs> plasmodium is a different disease. So the question yeah. was, um, if you use that fungus in uh, biocontrol, if it's going to have that um, the disease or the, the kind of resistance, if it's up all the time, what, did I get that right? Yeah, like if it would lead to like a base of energy. And so, Bit, uh, like, would, would it be like a mental to the plant? Um, I ask myself these questions a lot as well, because as I said, so we have a better reproductive success, they have more flowers. Usually more flowers means less biomass, but if I measure the biomass, it's not actually changed that much. I don't know what the fungus does in, or in terms of a resource allocation, but so far, of course, the thing is, if you have priming, I mean, priming is a very low energy response. It's, it's very energy efficient. And I'm pretty sure that acrimonium is capable of doing that. So this would be not so detrimental for the energy metabolism. But the thing with the flowering thing and raising the, um, the resistance of the plant, of course, the plant will always um, have, basically a fitness, um, well, it has, will have a problem with its fitness because it has to put some coast, of course, into development and others into defense. That's, I mean, that's always the trade-off thing, or well, that's always the, the competition. Um, I think it's capable. So what we see is the PR1 level, as I said, is always higher when we have both of these microbes, but they, they rise throughout the course of the disease. And, and these plants are doing better, um, against the disease. So they will probably, in the end, if you have a field application, you might have smaller plants, that's possible. But the trade-off for that would be you have a smaller plant that still is able to reproduce because for rapeseed, you want the seeds. So you have seeds, not so many, but you have them. In comparison to you have a diseased plant and you don't really have any seeds or the quality is really bad. So these are the two things you will have. Um, the thing why we work in biocontrol is, or why I'm interested in that, so in the European Union, there's a lot of the chemical control means that the Canadians can use, or that I'm pretty sure you can use in Australia. They are not available to us because they are detrimental for farmers' health and for environment and so on and so forth. So we have to go into that direction. Acrimony alternatum will not be the solution. It, it will be probably a combination of different methods, and probably if we use that fungus, it could work. But yeah, side effects and stuff, we haven't studied that yet. 
All right, so more questions, if you don't mind. Um, so it's a very question around, like a more molecular question again, around, it's a relationship between PR1 and cytokinin. And does the cytokinin effect explain the flowering biomass resistance trade-offs? So the first, the questions, does cytokinin explain um, the more flowering? Uh, like yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we look into cytokinin response right now to see if that flowering is related to that, although we could look at ethylene as well. Um, we found so far, but this is extended culture stuff, the fungus is able to trigger IPTs, so these isopentanyl transferases, which are responsible for cytokinin production. Mm. Could be, so they are elevated, but actually it's a little complex, only under certain conditions. So under certain stress conditions, the fungus can trigger cytokinin related biosynthesis genes, but it does not under other conditions. And the other question I didn't understand because my internet was like not proof. The other question was about, is there a relationship between PR1 and the cytokinin response? Um, cytokinin, I think right now, some cytokinins are known to be involved in resistance responses. I'm not able to answer on that yet, actually. So we started looking at that, but yeah, no. There are a few papers about the relationship of cytokinin and defense resistance in plants. They are better explaining that, I think. I'm not in that interaction. I cannot say much about that yet. All right, so, and another question was, so are there any fungal secondary metabolites involved in the response, especially maybe suppressing the protists directly, like as an anti-protist activity? That's very likely. The thing is in direct interaction fungus against fungus, um, acrimonium is not very competitive. So against very aggressive diseases like Fusarium or Aspergillus, if you do just a normal interaction study, it just loses. So it's an endophyte. It grows super slow. I'm pretty sure it can do some specialized compounds, or I'm not sure. It, it's very likely, but we haven't found them so far. Because as I said, it's not very competitive against other fungi yet. I haven't tested bacteria. Um, what it is able to do is produce auxin. That's something we found. So it can make auxin. I mean, a lot of fungi, you know, can make um, hormones that are plant hormones, basically. Well, just some compounds, in that case, coming out of the tryptophan uh, biosynthesis. So it might be also able to, to produce cytokine or something, which would explain the flowering thing. But for secondary metabolites, I have no clue yet. I would have to do um, some analytics to do that, and I'm not yet there, time-wise, skill-wise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that's all the questions there were for now. Um, if people have other questions, you could always go to the Slack and ask Susan something or uh, send her an email, of course, too. Uh, thank you very much, Susan, for being our first uh, presenter in the series, which will go on for some time, uh, hopefully also in the future beyond this. Thank you very much for being our guinea pig and having a great talk and uh, good all Right. So. At the end, the last is, so this was number one. We will have a seminar next week, which is by Remco Stam. Uh, this will be on Monday at same time, so 7 p.m. Uh, no, 7 p.m. Australian time or 9 a.m. European, Central European time. Um, the seminar will be entitled uh, The Diversity Molecular Evolution of Plant Defense Against Pathogen in Nature. So stay tuned, come along and check out the OPPP Slack and web page for more information because we already have three or four more seminars um, planned and there will be, you can also sign up uh, via Google form. So thank you again for Susan, uh, one round of applause and you all have a good day, good night, wherever you are. Thank you. Bye.